Today on the show, we're going to be talking about brand value and intellectual property when assessing a business. It's going to be great. I'm David C. Barnett, and you're tuned in to Small Business and Deal Making, the podcast, YouTube channel, and blog where I talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium sized businesses while controlling risk. So, if you're looking to take control of your future through buying a business one day, or if you already own a business and you're looking to grow or exit, you've come to the right place. I talk about interesting things, I talk to interesting people, and I answer your questions every week right here. So, be sure to hit like and be sure to hit subscribe, and let's get to it. Are you thinking of growing your business or beginning a journey into entrepreneurship? Take a shortcut to success by buying an existing and profitable business the right way. Visit businessbuyeradvantage.com and learn more about my online training, group coaching, and consulting services designed to help you win. So I've gotten uh, actually many questions and comments on the YouTube channel over the course of time about things like evaluating a brand or intellectual property or things like customer or past client lists that might exist within a small business that someone's looking at buying. And, you know, people will have this idea. Uh, and I think this is sometimes a, a seed of thought that might be planted by a business owner or a seller um, who is kind of trying to figure out why does my business hold value? What what justification might I have for saying that I want a certain price for my business, right? And so one of the things that will often come up is, well, I've been I've been here for a long time. So I've, you know, in my part of the world, uh, there's uh, businesses that have these incredibly long track records that literally been open since the 1800s. Uh, and people will often point to this as a reason why the business is worth more than a business that may be younger. Right. Or people will say, you know, this this brand is known in the marketplace or has a great reputation and therefore it's you should pay more to acquire this business. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to take us all through a little thought experiment um, and to help you understand the way that you should be looking at this whole idea of brand value or, you know, with respect to small and medium sized business. So if you imagine yourself at the grocery store. Um, and you're in the soda aisle. And so there's usually some kind of store brand pop, right? Like there's, um, you know, local brand cola, my grocery store brand cola, right? And a two liter bottle of this stuff might be, you know, $1.25 or $1.50. And then right next to it will be Coca-Cola. And it could be $3.49. It could be double or more than double the same price as the store brand. Now, what are these two products? They are flavored fizzy sugar water, right? That's that's what they are. And so some people go in there and they say, I want some, some fizzy soda water and they'll choose the store brand, right? Because in that person's mind, they, they want something, uh, they want that product and they're looking for the best value. They're gonna take, take the lower priced one. Other people are gonna go in there and they're going to reach for the Coca-Cola. Now, why are they choosing to pay more than double the price for the Coca-Cola? Well, somewhere in their evolution and development as a person, they are associating certain things with the Coca-Cola that hold greater value for them. Now, it could be a subjective preference for taste. They might believe that they prefer the taste of the Coca-Cola more. Or maybe they're on their way somewhere where there will be other people and they want that Coca-Cola brand to represent, you know, something about them that, uh, you know, that they are willing to invest in a higher price thing because they think it's going to deliver more value to their friends or something like this, right? There, there's all kinds of things that could be going on in the mind of that person that is going to make them choose the Coca-Cola over the store brand, right? And so what has Coca-Cola done? Well, over a hundred years of constant marketing, advertising, product placement, et cetera, they have created these ideas, beliefs, values, et cetera, in the minds, mind of the public. And that allows them to retail their product for a higher price point, which means that their gross margins are going to be higher than the gross margins of the store brand soda, right? And so that's eventually going to lead to higher reported earnings on the bottom line. 
And so how do we know that Coca-Cola has goodwill, right? Well, goodwill is an accounting definition. It's basically the difference between the value someone's willing to pay for a business and the value of the tangible assets within that business. So if we're going to bring this into the, the world of small business, um, a business that actually has a tangible, reputable, well-known brand that leads people to go out of their way to do business with that company and allows that company to charge a higher price, what's going to happen is that they're going to be able to have higher margins in that business, more profit is going to fall to the bottom line of that business, and that means the, the market value someone's willing to pay for that business to obtain that cash flow is going to be higher, hopefully, than the value of the stuff within the business. The inventory, the equipment, the vehicles, whatever is in the business that is required to make the business go. So the more valuable the brand is, the higher the margins, the more profits on the bottom line, the bigger the goodwill is going to end up being when we do this final calculation at the end. And so just simply the fact that the brand has been around for 100 years or the brand is well known, my first question is always, does this allow you to therefore charge a higher price? Are you able to command more in the marketplace? Are you able to have a better gross margin than your competitors? And 99% of the time in the world of small business, the answer to that is no. Um, and so, yes, it can be a long-lived company. Yes, it can be well-known. But the current owner has not been able to take those advantages and turn them into higher profitability. And so from a buyer's point of view, does that then mean that you should be paying extra money to obtain that? I would argue no, right? But I would also say that the fact that you've got that history, that, that brand name that may, may be well known, is going to give you what I call a reason to buy. So if there's two different businesses for sale and one of them has a better positioning or better brand that you may be able to work with, you might prefer that one over another company. And so these are sort of the, the subjective characteristics when it comes to small businesses when you're looking at buying one, um, because it, it, it's all about your plan, right? I'm always saying to people, you pay for what you get, but the reason why you wanna buy has to do with what you can do with the business. So if you look at that business and you think this person hasn't done a very good job with their marketing effort, they haven't done a good job at using that 100 year tradition or whatever it is to sort of create the story and, you know, weave the fabric of a, you know, a tale or, or manipulate or manage the perception that the public might have about the brand and what it's what the products and services are worth based on this history. Well, I can buy that business and I can use all the folklore related to that brand to really do something better from a marketing point of view. That's a motivation to buy. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean you should pay the seller for what you're going to do because you're the one that's going to have to take all of that you know, clay and you're going to have to mold it into something that is legitimately worth more where some where people in the public are going to be willing to pay more for the product or service. So that same kind of argument that I've just gone through about branding is the same with any other kind of intellectual property as far as I'm concerned. So I've had the same sort of questions brought up to me about, you know, proprietary software or, you know, proprietary formulations or methodologies or any kind of thing like this even stuff that's protected in law, like a patent or something. And my, my argument is always the same, like, does that allow them to have an advantage? So if they have a patented process that allows them to achieve the result in half the time uh, as their competitors, then they should be allowed to then use that advantage to get higher profits. Right. And a lot of the times when we get into this, get into this stuff, we, we don't see the dem demonstrable results of these quote unquote advantages actually playing out. But you know, case by case, I mean, you can find something like this. Um, what about customer lists? This is another one that that I often see bandied about that. Hey, this business has this great customer list. And in fact, I got a specific question about selling customer lists from someone the other day. And so same kind of thinking. Does having a thousand people on a customer list allow you to earn more money? 
Now, a lot of the times a business that you're looking at, they'll have this huge database of past clients, but they're not doing anything with it. They're not mailing letters to these people. They're not emailing these people. They're not calling these people on a regular basis. And so they, when it comes time to sell, they want to hold it forth as a great advantage or opportunity for a buyer, but they themselves have not demonstrated how this advantage can play out for them. And so one of the issues can be, and I had an interview with, uh, with a great email marketing expert in my business buyer adventure um, in the group coaching program. Um, and uh, basically what he was saying is he said, you know, if you had a thousand emails from past customers that you had never emailed before, and then you bought that business and you started emailing those people, what you will get is 900 spam complaints, right? Because those people are not habituated to having a regular communication and conversation with that business. And so taking that list of a thousand clients and actually using it to some kind of economic benefit is going to require a huge amount of effort on the part of whoever decides to monetize it, which is likely going to be you as the buyer. So here's the big question I would pose. Why would you pay a seller for work that you've got to do, right? If you're going to have to take that list and you're going to have to start from stage one and say, okay, what are we going to do? Are we going to start mailing postcards to these people? Are we going to start, you know, a letter campaign or Christmas cards or, or, you know, are we going to start calling these people and asking them if they, if it's time for some kind of uh, follow-up service to whatever it is that we did for them. Like all of that effort is going to take a further investment beyond just buying the business. You're either going to have to invest in the money for the marketing effort, you know, the cost of printing, the cost of stamps, et cetera, or you're going to have to invest in time to have employees do things like call people uh, or maybe invest money in having a telemarketing agency, you know, call those people and, and try to generate more leads from them, et cetera. It's not going to be this instant panacea of immediate revenue. If it was, the sellers would be doing it, right? And at the end of the day, this is always getting back to that same trope or the same idea that business owners will have is they'll think buyers just have to do X, Y, or Z and it will generate more money. And the response to that is always the same. If it's so easy to make more money with this business, why hasn't the seller done it? Anyway, uh, I hope that helps. If you have any other thoughts or ideas about you know the value of brand or intellectual property or something like customer lists, please comment down below. And listen, if you haven't already, um, make sure you sign up for my email list. Uh, I know a good portion of you are now watching my videos from your uh, the comfort of your living room couch on your smart TVs. So just uh, hold up your cell phone with the camera, take a look at that QR code and sign up for my email list. I send out stuff every day, stories, answering questions, uh, links to new videos, uh, updates, commentary on old videos, etc. Um, and I get a lot of positive feedback. People enjoy the stuff. So with that, I'll say, see you later. Keep the questions coming and we'll talk to you all next time. So how can you learn more about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium sized businesses? Easy. Go over to my blog site, davidcbarnett.com, where you can learn more about me and how I work with my clients. You can learn more about my books and courses that I've prepared for you. You can find out how to subscribe to my email list, the YouTube playlists, and more. There's literally hundreds of hours of content there, all for free, and I'd love for you to be my guest. Special thanks go to Mark Willis at Lake Growth Financial, today's video sponsor. Mark helps people better manage their personal and business finances through the bank on yourself insurance strategy. This is something I've done personally and I've seen others use it successfully for years. Go to newbankingsolution.com to find all the interviews I've done with Mark and learn more about the advantages of these programs. While there, sign up for a free consultation to learn what this solution might look like for you.